Welcome to Digital Disconnect. I'm your host, Scott Ritzema, for this series of 13 programs dealing with probably one of the most pressing issues there is for us to talk about in this digital age, and that is our media use. And I mean all of our media use. We often talk about the kids these days, and boy, they sure are struggling. We'll talk a lot about child development and the family dynamics and, and social issues, relational issues. But every single one of us can ask, Lord, speak into my life how I can better glorify you with my media use. And I'm going to start with two, two slides here right out of the gates that will give us that that urgent sense and need to pray and, and open this series with prayer. Because when you hear that it's not just that we like our media, listen to this quotation in a moment. I'm going to show it to you. Gotta, I got to explain who the guy is that's saying this. He worked for the, the, the big smartphone company, the ones that invented the smartphones. And he was in the neuromarketing department. So they were, they were experts at looking at your brain and how your brain functions when you're using their product. And so what he said is, what happens is you have a very specific relationship with your iPhone. What we learned from a very recent study we did was that there were actually two activations happening for people who are in love with their iPhones. Did you hear what I said? In love. Because we actually realized from the study that the same area of the brain that is activated when you are in love with someone is activated when you are in love with your iPhone. Now, just let that sink in for a second. I like my iPhone. A lot of people like their other devices by whatever name. We like media. We like to use these things. But I, I, wouldn't, I hope I don't pass over the line from like to love, like I'm in love with it, like I love my wife and love my children. You love your sister, your mother, your pet, maybe. Those are normal things. This is a device, a piece of hardware, and we're crossing over the line into a love relationship with our iPhone. I mean, you could just start with the fact that that is strange and weird, uh, but maybe that's problematic on spiritual levels and on relational levels that we're going to study in this series. I have another quotation I want to show you that will also give us an urgent need to begin with prayer. It comes from George Barna. Now, he's one of the top researchers in the world in terms of gathering information and understanding the societal trends. And what he stated straight out, this is several years ago, he said, media exposure has become America's most widespread and serious addiction. Now, when I had the chance to speak with George Barna about that and look at his research, he said, Scott, you realize it's actually the majority of Americans that qualify for an addiction when you use the same diagnostic criteria that they use in psychiatry circles to figure out if somebody's addicted to alcohol or whatever. You use those same questions and criteria on our media, and the majority of us would qualify for an addiction to media. So as we begin, many people might think, oh, I don't have a problem with media. This is a good seminar for those other people. But maybe this will reach us in our problem areas where we might be falling in love with our media and or addicted to our media. Because at that point, I'm not going to be objective and honest and fair about evaluating my own media use. I have to ask for divine insight. And that's what we're going to do right now. Would you bow your heads with me and pray this prayer in your heart? Father in heaven, we want to ask for your spirit to speak to us. We don't want our own opinions, our own preferences to rule but we want your will to be made known and to be done. Thy will be done is our prayer. So please give us courage to face where we could make some changes and find greater joy in you by doing so. And our hearts, of course, go out to the children, to the young people who are so steeped in and immersed in and addicted to so much worldly media. And Lord, as we expose and understand the nature of that controversy for the souls of men, give us discernment, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. I want to begin with a question. Now, I used to teach history. I used to be a teacher, so I'm going to make you think a little bit here, okay? The question is, when in history was the invention of the first telecommunications device, the first electronic media device? 
So you're thinking back. Maybe this is television. No, before that, there was radio. Maybe some of you uh, watching this remember when the television was invented. My, my grandpa actually was a salesman for Zenith Televisions. I find that terribly ironic because here I do seminars on media at churches and on satellite networks and on the Internet. And exposing the harmful effects of worldly media and excessive media, and uh, it's in my family tree. But um, maybe you think back before Grandpa the Zenith salesman, and, and God bless him, by the way, I praise God for televisions that we can use to watch 3ABN, that we can use to watch good things on. But um, these screens can be used to God's glory, because when you go back and see when was the first one, not, not radio, not the silver screen, not the phonograph, go back further. We're looking at 19th century. When in the 19th century was the world's first media device invented? The year was 1844. You're thinking there was no media in 1844. Electronic media, what are you talking about? Look at this image. This is Samuel Morse tapping away the world's first text message. <laughs> the, the, the telegraph is what we're looking at there. And you know what the message was? The message was Numbers 23, verse 23. What hath God wrought? Can media be used by God to the glory of God to spread the message of hope and salvation to the world? Amen. That's what we're doing right now. But 1844 is a pivotal year in prophetic history. Those who studied Daniel chapter 8, verse 14 actually refers to a prophetic time period that you can chart when studying Daniel 9 as the beginning point. It ends in 1844. And so this is the last days that we are in, 1844, the beginning of the investigative judgment, the heavenly sanctuary cleansing. That's something to study if you've never studied into that. So if 1844 ushers in the last days, we have to ask, Lord, what are you doing through us and in us? during this urgent time in earth's history. And how does the devil feel about that? Because he's running around like a devouring lion and seeking whom he may deceive and bring down into the pit of darkness. Well, that's exactly what media is doing today, isn't it? Worldly media, excessive quantities of media, um, a, a media addiction. And so when we think about a media seminar, it's not so much a question of is media bad or is media good? Media can be used for either. This is not even a seminar about media, really. This series of programs is about relationships with Jesus, with each other, with our families, with our churches, with reaching the lost. You see, when you think about digital disconnect, it's a great concept because it's a, it's, it has two meanings. The digital media has di disconnected us from one another in many ways. A divide in the home, uh, generation gaps, a disconnect between us and our Savior if we are compromising in our media use and consuming that which is of the world. But at the same time, if we are willing to disconnect from it, then the digital disconnect, if you will, can bring great joy. The disconnect from so much media can bring us into a better experience of how to be human again. That's the name of this particular session, which that got me thinking when I, was think, when I was looking at these clips online. Have you seen them? Where somebody's on their device and they, you know, fall down the stairs. Or one, one that really got my attention, you can see this video actually in the, the series that, that we put out, our ministry, Belt of Truth Ministries, put out a series called The Media Mind. And in that one, there's a guy walking down the street with his phone and he's in this alley and ahead of him, you're watching, he's approaching a manhole with ribbons around it, and it's, 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 it's plainly marked. He walks right through the barriers and falls down right into the hole. And I go, wow, we've got an issue when these sorts of things are happening. Not just that, but you have pedestrian traffic incidents happening. Car and Driver magazine headline, huge rise in pedestrian traffic incidents. And in general, cell phone-related injuries. Have you ever heard of cell phone-related injuries? I haven't, but there, the, when, I, when I heard this for the first time, I thought, okay, we're in a new place then when there's such a thing as that. They're up 84% at one point, and people are walking into oncoming traffic, so we're going to have to start reorienting how we do human society, aren't we? What they did was they, you're going to see a, a graphic of a, a crosswalk where instead of people looking at the stop and go signs up at eye level, which were where we have lived for thousands of years, looking up and around us, 
we're on our devices looking down, and so many people are walking into oncoming traffic where a bus is coming, you have to have the signals there at foot level, at ground level. That got my attention definitely as I was thinking, how did God design for us to be human? How about the media mind of this age has become disconnected from the people around us, from the object around us, from the hole, from the traffic, from, <laughs> from the lamppost. Here's another graphic that got my attention. In Austria, they had to put pads on the lampposts because people are walking into them. And in America, they actually had a federal grant at one point to study how can we get alerts on people's phones to tell them when they are approaching the curb so that we can reduce the traffic incidents of people walking in. So, so I, I can't tell when I'm approaching the street how to be human again indeed. We need to rediscover how to walk and not walk into oncoming traffic. Another thing about how to be human again that got my attention was the concept of kyphosis. People are on their devices and they're hunched over. When we're at a 49 degree, 45 degree angle, there's 49 pounds of pressure that's being applied on the upper spine there. And that's actually reshaping the muscles into a permanent forward head posture. They call it hyperkyphosis. And they're saying this is happening with young people too, not just the elderly as normal we, as we age, you know, we come down. But another thing with young people is this one that you'll see a graphic of a Washington Post article with the, 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 the scan there, the x-ray of a little bony protrusion. And it says horns are growing on young people's skulls. Phone use is to blame, research suggests. And then this one with the potty with a, with a, with a tablet on it, and you're like, what is that? A digital potty? I didn't know there was such a thing. Well, yeah, kids can't learn to use the potty with a normal potty anymore because everything has to be gamified. Every ha everything has to be incentivized and done on a digital screen. What is this world coming to? Well, we've been told we're, we're, we've achieved some level of social connectedness because everybody can be on social media. We can all be online together, and it's a great social boon of relational connectedness. We're the most socially connected generation in history, we've been told. But then when I understand that we are the most lonely generation in history, when you look at the Surgeon General of the United States come out and say, we have an epidemic of loneliness. In Japan, they just appointed a minister of loneliness, uh, meaning like a secretary, a cabinet level office in their government. And, and this one really was strange to me. When I learned about the um, the cuddling with strangers craze. Did you ever hear about that? That was definitely pre-COVID, but people were going out because they're so lonely and they just want to hug that they go out and hook up with strangers at a cuddling cafe or hire a professional cuddler to come to their house and snuggle with them and give them a hug. How sad. By the way, if you know people in your area who have not had a visit, who have not had the love of Jesus Christ in the arms of him reaching out, Reach out right now. We are the body of Christ, the hands and feet of Christ to solve this crisis of loneliness that social media is not solving. It's causing it. And if you're feeling lonely right now, know that Jesus is right there with you. And praise God, we can have this tool of media right now to come together in a, in a way that we wouldn't have been able to do prior to 1844 and the invention of the telegraph. So we're going to keep using these devices to God's glory. But uh, have you noticed our society sure is crumbling in so many ways. For those who are weirded out by the cuddling with strangers craze, by the way, there's the chair that will hug you back. Yes, look at that graphic. You can't believe that's a real thing till you see it in USA Today. Some inventor in South Korea said, people are so lonely, we better make chairs that hug them. Yikes. So what is the solution to this? Well, God always has the solutions. Um, sometimes just seeing what the problem is, you identify the solution. You know that social media is increasing loneliness because all the studies are showing it. Well, they did a couple of studies where they said, well, let's just take people off social media for one week. One of them was at the University of Pennsylvania. Another one was a Denmark study. And in one of the cases, they brought social media use down to 30 minutes per day. And in the other one, it was a social media fast. And what were the results? Well, You'll find it not surprising that after one week of no social media use, loneliness scores dropped significantly in young adults who were studied in these studies. One week of no social media or very limited social media use reduces your loneliness. Oh, we're going to get more into that when we look at the session called anti-social media because really you can't necessarily call it social media when it's increasing loneliness. It is 
anti-social media if it is increasing our loneliness. So the media mind, if you will, is becoming more lonely, but the mind of Christ fulfilled. You see, that's the solution Jesus wants to bring to us. The fulfilling experience of relational connectedness. When you disconnect some from your digital immersion, again, they are tools. Utilize them, but don't be used by them. When we have a commitment to make a digital disconnect of some kind, we find relational connectedness starts to take over our experience with Jesus and with each other. We'll look at that in the session called Anti-Social Media. But again, this session is called How to Be Human Again. Did you know that the average American touches, taps, and swipes their device 2,617 times per day? 2,617 times per day. You multiply that by 365 days in the year, and you get almost a million touches, taps, and swipes of these devices. It's almost as if that's the world we live in now, the virtual world, a counterfeit reality. You know, I was thinking about when I was looking at that, those numbers, I was like, how many, how many times am I touching, tapping, and swiping? We're all reevaluating. Okay, am I using too much media? I mean, it's not worldly. I'm using it as a tool, but maybe there's a quantity that uh, I've reached peak media use, and it's going to become problematic for my, my joy and relationships and everything. 2,617 time of the, time, times of these. How many times did I touch my children today? How many times, even just a pet or, or, or wood and nails or, or, or soil and plants or cooking and real physical non-virtual things? Are we touching those a million times a year? I don't have any data on that. You're going to hear a lot of information in this series. Hopefully it's information that prompts us to think and rethink our media use. And, and it comes with a transformation of the Holy Spirit. Because when we look at the latest numbers, they are absolutely catastrophic. Our society is crumbling under media addiction. Take a look at these stats. Teens today now consume nine hours of entertainment media per day. Parents aren't far behind with eight hours per day, so we can't judge too harshly there, can we? The average adult spends more time looking at screens than sleeping. The average American spends 65% of their waking hours consuming media. The average American now spends 4.7 hours on their smartphone per day and checks their phones 80 times per day, up to 150 times per day in some studies, and somehow manages to still watch four hours of television per day. And you're thinking, how, is, how are these numbers even possible? It's coming to the point where it, keeping track of the numbers is an ir irrelevant exercise because 45% of teens, when asked, how much are you on your phone during the day? The answer they give is almost constantly on our devices. Now I want to warn us against something. It's really easy to look at what the culture is doing out there and feel comfortable because I'm not nearly that crazy with my media overuse. But the Bible gives us a warning. It says they that compare themselves among themselves are not wise. So we don't want to measure ourselves by the standard of the world. We don't want to be conformed to the world. We want to be transformed by the renewing of our minds according to the standard and plan that God has for us. So 2 Corinthians 10 verse 12 gives us some good wisdom. Not be comparing ourselves among ourselves. But I saved one more statistic for last here in, this, in the section on, on some data because this one was, whoa, ominous. The number of minutes of media per day for the average American a few years ago, it came out with Nielsen Media to exactly 666 minutes of media per day. Now, I'm not suggesting that is a fulfillment of Bible prophecy, but when you see in Revelation 13 a ominous number of the beast, 666, and then you look at that, that's the exact number of minutes of media use that the average American was consuming during that year. Uh, that, is, that is a very large number as well, not just a ominous, prophetic, and dark-sounding number. But um, we also want to become thinkers, and what I mean by that is... We know deception is coming in the last days. And when we're looking at the amount of media we are consuming per day, somebody sent me an article from a mainstream news outlet that said kids today aren't spending any, any more time with media now than they were in the 1980s. 
and you're scratching your head going, that's not correct. That was stated in a mainstream news article and people just are fed with propaganda and passively receive whatever is promulgated through these supposed credible outlets. Kids today are not spending any more time with media than they were in the 80s? Well, what is the actual data on that? Jean Twenge at San Diego State University has looked at that in great detail, and she's the one that gave us that nine hours per day in 2016. Was that, so that's a number of years ago. I don't know what it is now, but in the 1980s, it was 3.5 hours per day. So uh, we've almost tripled since the 80s. So I think we can sum that up with the media mind becomes deceivable. But the mind of Christ will be critically thinking. We must be thinkers, not mere reflectors of other men's thoughts. And I include myself in that. Whenever I was a classroom teacher, or whenever I go to churches to do these seminars, and I'm speaking on media on the brain, I'm always challenging listeners to this seminar to take this information to God for yourself and seek truth and think and make decisions that God is leading you to make, not being a, a uh, mere reflector of other men's thoughts. That's a very important principle in the last days when deception is coming. But really the bottom line is if we're going to make our lives what God wants them to make, we have to have standards. We have to have rules in our media use. And that might not sound like something we want to do, like, oh, I don't want rules. You know, I, is that legalism? No, we've got to make our own expectations for our children and for ourselves, frankly, in terms of a bunch of questions. Let me put a few questions up on the screen for you, and you'll see the kinds of things we're going to be asking ourselves through this series. What kinds of media are we consuming? At what ages? So uh, with the children there. On what types of devices? At what locations are these mobile devices? For what purposes? Is this entertainment purposes? At what time of the day? At what frequency of use, so how often, and for what duration of use, so the length of time. If we can tackle those questions, and if we can say, all right, I'm going to have my own standards and rules that God is leading me on. And I, by the way, I can tell you when it comes to what kinds of media, that first question you saw on there. If we're discussing worldly media, something that has principles of, 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 of this world, of Satan's kingdom, not of the kingdom of God, then how, man, how many hours should we be consuming of that per day? And at what times of the day? And for what duration of use? And so on. Well, the Bible is clear. It says, come apart and be separate, saith the Lord. Touch no unclean thing, and I will receive you. No unclean thing. Zero hours of worldly media. And we're going to touch on that later. But a lot of these opening sessions that we're doing together will be dealing with digital devices that we find as tools, but still we can get out of control with. So every person listening will take these ideas and these thoughts and this information, take it to God with an open heart and an open Bible. And my goal is to prompt us to think. And when I receive thousands, literally, of, of emails and contacts and talking to people at churches and at conferences, and they say, I made changes in my media use and saw positive results spiritually and every in every way it's kind of like well you thought you were okay before you made the changes but I don't need I don't need to make any dietary changes or the way I live my life is good I'm comfortable I don't need to make changes in my media use says the average person like the average person would go into my father's optometry office okay my dad was an optometrist and he would have people come in and say oh I don't need a new I don't need glasses I, I can see just fine I don't have any problems with my eyesight. And my dad, the doctor, would say to them, you know, are you seeing blurry? Are you sure everything's good? Well, let's go ahead and give you a little, uh, little test here. And down come the instruments over the eyes, right? <laughs> the moment of truth. Read that top line here. Okay, yeah, that's A-M-V-W-R. Read that second line, please. Wait a minute, the second line? I'm supposed to be able to read that? What is that? Is that a C or a G or an O or a Q? I don't know. I can't read the second line, Doc. And then he does the whole drill of which one is clearer, one or two? Two, two, or three? Um, two, two, or four? Two is still the clearest there, Doc. And he breaks it to you. You thought you were seeing okay, but you can see even better when you have a prescription and you tried something, you see the analogy here with our media use? 
We try something different, we, like those people did in that study in Denmark, University of Pennsylvania studies. Let's, let's just take away social media for a week or reduce it to 30 minutes a day. Oh, all of a sudden, you notice a difference. You ask those people beforehand. They, oh, I'm fine, I'm fine, right? We all are fine. But, but God wants to prompt us to try something different. He says, test me in these things and see if I don't open the floodgates of blessing upon you. And he says, taste and see that the Lord is good. You will seek me and find me when you search for me with all your heart. So that's the quest we are on. This is not a seminar about media as much as it is a seminar about our relationship with Jesus Christ and our relationships with each other and the family unit that God is so interested in restoring in the last days. Now, as I was listening to the information about eyesight and media use, you know, you do a lot of near work, you have a lot of screen time, it increases the risk of myopia and nearsightedness. You know, my dad's voice echoed in my brain, Scott, you're going to be in your 40s and you're going to get, you're going to need glasses. And I've been holding on. I'm eating, eating a lot of carrots and a lot of vegetables and beta carotene. And I'm going to try to eat healthy and have a good uh, eye, uh, ocular hygiene, my dad calls it, you know, blink a lot when you're doing screen work and take your eyes off the screen every once in a while and reset. So I'm, I'm going to try to not have the same problems that, that people have had because of media use. Well, I, 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 I realize that when that happens, I'm doing something to my brain, to the melatonin in my brain when I'm looking at media at night. Now think about this, okay? When the sun sets, it's a certain type of light that is, that, is, that is communicating to our brains, time to go to sleep. Melatonin is produced in the brain. And, and when it's morning and daytime, it's bright lights, right? Well, our digital media simulates the bright lights. And so as you look at the graphic here, you'll see the kid with the, with the phone right before bed versus the old hearth side and the candlelight and the, 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 that feeling of really going to sleep with peace. The Bible says... God giveth his beloved sleep. That's in Psalm 127. Thou shalt lie down and thy sleep shall be sweet. And so God wants us to have energy the next day. You know, when, when children use devices before bed, they're two times more likely to be sleepy the ne next day. And just 15 minutes can do it, especially video games, because they increase cortisol release. They increase stress hormones. Even social media can do that. Teens are way sleep de deprived. They should be getting nine hours per night. They're getting less than seven. Adults too, 87% of us go to bed with and wake up with our devices and these things take their toll on our sleep. I wanna have a, the mind of Christ becomes energized, but the media mind tired. And that's the bottom line there. But God has a better plan for us, doesn't he? In all the aspects that we're discussing here. And so he wants to bring joy to our lives, restoration to our relationships, and ultimately inspiration that we can overcome whatever besetting addictions, habits are getting us down. Seek him with all your heart and he will be found by you.